We here at Vice have been fascinated by North Korea for a long time. In fact, we've done three documentaries about the Hermit Kingdom, all of which have been harshly critical of the regime. You have to go to the house of the people, the library of the people. You have to see the soccer team of the people. But the one thing that we didn't do was meet any of the actual people of North Korea. It's not very busy here. For that reason, I'm personally never allowed to go back to the UPRK. But we wanted to get inside the country again to see firsthand how it's faring under its new, very young, and very mysterious leader, Kim Jong-un. One of the biggest challenges in dealing with North Korea on any level is that we have virtually no diplomatic relations with them. In fact, over the past 65 plus years, only a handful of Americans have ever met the country's leaders, the most prominent of which was Secretary of State Madeleine Albright during a visit to the country when she brought Kim Jong-il a basketball signed by Michael Jordan. Now, she did this because, despite his public disdain for America, Kim Jong-il privately loved the Chicago Bulls. His passion for the 90s era Bulls was passed on to his son, Kim Jong-un, and banking on the dynasty's inherent love for basketball, we worked through official and back channels to propose a goodwill game of basketball with North Korea's national team. If they accepted, we would bring three members of the Harlem Globetrotters, who are the most natural ambassadors of goodwill in the game, and a real live Chicago Bull. And much to our surprise, it worked. The DPRK actually invited our delegates to come to North Korea and participate in a very, very rare, quote unquote, foreign sports exchange program. The timing, however, turned out to be very tricky, because in December of 2012, North Korea launched the Kwang Myung Sung 3 satellite into the Earth's orbit, stirring fears that the country's missile program could soon be advanced enough to carry a nuclear weapon as far as the United States. And just so we didn't forget exactly what these missiles would be carrying, they conducted a third nuclear test to make sure we got the message. This, of course, set the international community on edge. So, in the midst of heightened tensions and heated rhetoric, we headed to Pyongyang to see if we could actually engage with the North Koreans through the cultural vehicle of basketball. The second you land in North Korea, you realize you're no longer in control of anything. The motor is waiting. Government monitors direct your every step. You're told where to go, what to do, and most importantly, what to film. And as other Westerners have found out the hard way, if you flaunt these restrictions, you could wind up in North Korean jail, one of the worst places on earth. Since our instincts are usually to shoot the exact opposite of what people want us to, I was more than a bit freaked out. Having the Harlem Globetrotters along with us on this trip was extremely comforting because they were some of the most positive guys we'd ever met. Hey, buddy. And I needed that comfort pretty much right away because as soon as we entered the hotel lobby, we were welcomed by a banner celebrating the recent nuclear test. Oh, God. At first, we thought the banner might have been put there for us. But when I opened up the curtains for my first look at Pyongyang, I saw a long line of buses leaving the hotel. And then... I turned on the TV. Nuclear scientists from the February 12th test, they're staying at this hotel right now. Uh, they were brought here by way of kind of reward, some sort of celebration uh, by the leader. So they're staying here at the same hotel with us, unsettling. So we weren't even there for a few hours, and this international nuclear controversy, with huge geopolitical ramifications, was playing out in our hotel lobby. He just always has to hold that out for practice. From the start, we were under very close supervision. They were watching us and what we were shooting 
at all times. I mean, it has a schedule. I mean, we have a lot of blinders um, whose full-time job it is to make sure that one of hey, to make sure that we stay on those schedules. So an army of people that are waiting for you to rush you onto the bus. We were always surrounded by guides, translators, and officials, many of whom we'd been warned were actually secret police. We'd agreed that along with the exhibition game, we'd host a basketball camp with what we thought would be a bunch of kids in a high school gym somewhere. Instead, we were ushered into a massive 10,000 seat stadium. Oh, this is nice. We'd also be working with the best under 18 players in the country. My name is Anthony Blakes, also known as Buckets. I'm number 15 with the world famous Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, we're going to show you guys some great things today and uh, hopefully give you an opportunity to learn something new as well as uh, make some new friends with us. On my whistle, first guy goes. Yeah. Go, close me, close me, close me. Hands up, hands up, good. Let's go. So they have to compete for the rebound. All right, ready? Go. This is what rebound is all about. You have to fight for it. Go, 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 go! go. Oh. Friendship on three. You know, play tingle. 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 One, two, three. Tingle! Good job. As we were leaving, we spotted North Korea's most famous basketball player, Ri Myung Hun, who had come out to watch the drills. Ri was at one time the tallest man in basketball. He was super excited about our visit, and he gathered us together for a chat. Just me and him. Dylan, don't throw out In a country that's known to suffer from malnutrition and the stunted growth that goes along with it, Ri is truly an exception. In fact, his height actually attracted the interest of American scouts. But due to trade sanctions, he was unable to pursue his dreams of playing in the NBA. And although loyal to North Korea, when he was once asked how he felt about not being able to play in the NBA, he replied, I'm not interested in money or politics. As a sportsman, I just want to try. As one of the trade-offs for allowing us to visit through this sports exchange, we agreed to go on their state-sanctioned tour. And like the beginning of any tour of North Korea, our first stop was an obligatory visit to the Sun Palace, where the country's last two leaders lie in state. North Korea is the last of the socialist-slash-communist cult of personality utopian states. And much like Stalin in the Soviet Union or Mao in China, their leaders are not only revered as political figures, but flat-out worshipped as gods. Kim Il-sung was installed by the Soviets as the first supreme leader in 1948. And in fact, he's still president of the DPRK today, even though he's been dead since 1994. Kim Il-sung was succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-il, who inherited his father's godlike excellence. And he was perfect at everything. Not only was he the greatest at military strategy and city planning, but also at filmmaking, furniture design, and even animal husbandry. When Kim Jong-il died in 2011, leadership was passed to his son, Kim Jong-un, about whom the world knows very, very little. These state-sanctioned tours of North Korea tend to be exactly the same year in, year out. But because of our basketball mission and our documentary, they created a new hand-tailored propaganda tour. They were going to show us how great the quality of life in North Korea really was. So instead of taking us to places like the most militarized border on Earth, the DMZ, they took us to the North Korean version of SeaWorld. Immediately, we knew we were stepping into something completely different. A huge crowd was already seated and waiting patiently for us to arrive. Front row seats. Even here, we were reminded of North Korea's nuclear prowess. And 
Interestingly, Kim Jong-un was not just credited as the mastermind behind all the missiles and bombs. He was also the choreographer of The Dolphin Show. Not only is Kim Jong-un great with dolphins, he's now personally responsible for inspecting, advising, and directing all aspects of North Korean life. with a red placard like that? Yes. Yes, wow, cool. Are there ever arguments over who gets to use the marshal's equipment? They would prefer the machine that we're actually inspecting. Of about course. Our of course. I don't even know what this is called, but I'm, I'm loving it. There is a thing that prevents your skin from getting older. That one makes you breast enlargement. Did you say they did breast enlargement in here as well? Yes. That one helps to enlarge breast and also it can treat breast cancers. Oh, wow. <laughs> Table tennis is the most popular sport in DPRK? Uh, no, it's not the most popular sport. What, what do you think is the most popular sport? I think basketball. Oh, basketball, good. Well, we came on the right mission then. At the end of the day, we were invited to indulge ourselves in a North Korean shopping spree. The mall was clearly a showpiece, designed to project an abundance of delicacies in a country that doesn't even have enough food to feed its people. The store is rammed with Western products and a very, very attentive sales staff. Coca-Cola, Doritos, Ruffles, <laughs> anything you want to get good and fat. I'm personally going to go with Coke. Like Coke. I love Coke. Yeah. Do you like Coke? Yeah, me too. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Okay, with the credit card? No. No? It would have felt just like a store at home if it weren't for the fact that A, we were the only customers there, and B, I couldn't actually buy anything. As we drove back to the hotel, I noticed that in spite of the country's well-documented chronic power shortages, this city was extremely well lit. Which made me think, were even the lights part of the tour as well? That might sound crazy, but when you look at satellite photos of the region, North Korea is completely dark. The next morning, we were driven to the International Friendship Exhibition, and the only cars that we saw on the long three-hour drive there were our own. The International Friendship Exhibition is basically this castle vault built into the side of a mountain that holds every gift ever given to the leadership of North Korea. They had gifts from the likes of Muammar Gaddafi, Leonid Brezhnev, the Sandinistas, and of course, Madeleine Albright, whose gift of a Michael Jordan signed basketball was the inspiration for this trip. A trip, by the way, that was getting progressively weirder, as we saw at our next stops, the Kim Il-sung University and Grand People Study House. After the prerequisite display of nuclear and missile technology, they gave us a tour demonstrating North Korea's openness to the outside world. If you could learn to fly, 